जनाबी स्पीकर आपका बहुत शुक्रिया आपने जो मौका दिया फाइनेंस बिल पर बात करने के लिए द लास्ट टाइम आई स्टूड हियर बिफोर यू आई कुड एंड लीव द कंट्री बिकॉज आई वॉज ऑन द एक्स कंट्रोल लिस्ट एंड फिर जब आपने जॉइंट सेशन बुलाया था मैंने काफ़ी कोशिश किया आई रश टू कम बैक बट अनफॉर्चुनेटली और एयर स्पेस वो शट एंड आई वॉज अनएबल टू मेक इट और फिर एक बार फिर इट्स राधा अनफॉर्चुनेट दैट द लास्ट टू डेज वी वर अनएबल एंड आई बिलीव दैट बोथ द अपोजिशन एंड द ट्रेजरी ब्रांचेस शेयर सम ऑफ द ब्लेम ऑन दिस बट वी वर अनएबल टू रन द बिजनेस ऑफ दिस हाउस पर्टिकुलरली गिवन द सर्कमस्टांसिस आर कंट्री आर फेसिंग दैट इज इंडीड अनफॉर्चुनेट बट वी आर वेरी ग्रेटफुल दैट टू डे Uh, you were allowing opposition parties to speak on the budget it would have been an uh, unprecedented move were there not to be a debate on the budget and while we thank you for that i must reiterate uh, on the floor of the house that it would be the most appropriate if there was a complete and proper debate on the finance bill uh first of all mr speaker i would like to take the opportunity uh to pay tribute to our brave soldiers who sacrifice so much to keep us safe i would like to pay tribute to the pakistani air force which has once again proven that they are indeed the best air force in the world i would like to make special mention of paf pilot hasan sadiqi who shot down the indian aircraft that had violated our sovereign territory and the courageous the two courageous soldiers shaheed abdul rab and shaheed khurram who sacrificed their lives on the line of control it would be remiss for me it would be remiss for me not to pay tribute to shaheed zulfikar ali bhutto whose foresight in developing pakistan's nuclear capabilities is today our best line of defense and to shaheed mohammad benazir bhutto who provided missile technology to pakistan and further strengthened our defense mr speaker i want to make it crystal clear that the significance of india's belligerence and naked aggression cannot be underestimated the violation of pakistan's sovereignty was an unprecedented violation a violation which has not taken place since 1971 and the onus the onus of this escalation falls solely and squarely on the shoulders of mr modi's hunbutwa extremist government to exploit to exploit a terrorist attack for petty political gain is awful in and of itself but to politicize war between two nuclear armed nations just so he can perform in his uh, electoral arena is really to descend to new depths of depravity the world mr speaker the world mr speaker may know may not know mr modi but the muslims of the subcontinent know him well the butcher of gujarat is infamous for his role in the gujarat massacre the very countries the very countries now parroting his line for pakistan to do more would not even grant him a visa to enter their countries because he was such an extremist hate monger with blood on his hands we have we have seen how the butcher of gujarat upon being elected to india's highest office has now become the butcher of kashmir as a new as a new generations of kashmiris rise up to demand their rights 
Modi's tyrannical government has broken all records of inhumanity. We have, we have watched in horror. We've watched in horror as the world stood idly by while young Kashmiris were blinded by pellet guns, while they were used as human shields, while rape was deployed as a weapon of suppression, oppression, and terror. The United Nations resolution, the United Nations resolution calling for a plebiscite in Kashmir gathers dust while the world is apathetic to the plight of Kashmiri Muslims. Let the plebiscite take place. Let the people of Kashmir deploy the democratic right and choose their destiny. And we can guarantee, Mr. Speaker, that there will be no such a uh, terrorist attack in Kashmir ever again. Obviously, obviously those who condemn violence must condemn violence on all sides. But the Pulwama attack wasn't the same as Mumbai or any other attack. This was not an attack by non-state actors coming from another country. This was an organic, domestic attack by a Kashmiri citizen of occupied Kashmir, attacking within occupied Kashmir, using explosives found within occupied Kashmir, reacting violently, reacting violently to generations of state terrorism in occupied Kashmir. And rather, rather than facing their own issues, India is trying in vain to pin this on Pakistan. After a humiliating electoral defeat in the last regional elections, the extremist Indian government thinks they can hate monger their way through the general elections. The world needs to understand, Mr. Speaker, the world needs to understand the dangers of this violation. We have already, we have already set dangerous international presidents in the name of fighting terrorism. We've already allowed non-state actors to decide the fate of nations. We've already allowed for the violation of international law when it comes to drone strikes in sovereign territories. The Osama, Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden was the world's most wanted terrorist. And in that case, we've already set dangerous international precedents. But there is no parallel to be drawn here. In this case, India has no cause, no justification, and no case. Do we really want this precedent to be set? Does the world really want this precedent to be set, Mr. Speaker? We are pleased. We are pleased that Pakistan has made the utmost and sincerest efforts for de-escalation. I would also like to appreciate the opposition members, for we showed a united front to the world. Uh, there was no petty politicking at the time of the Indian attacks. None of the opposition members joined with Defy Pakistan Council and held rallies against the government. None of the opposition members None of the opposition members dared to declare Imran Khan a security risk for trying to make peace overtures to India. Hopefully, we have drawn a line in the sand and that sort of politics is in the past, Mr. Speaker. I must, I must also appreciate the Chief of Army Staff for promptly at a time of crisis um, and at this very crucial time, briefing parliament, briefing parliamentary leaders, this is how democracy functions, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, it was incredibly unfortunate that the Prime Minister chose not to attend. This was 
the wrong message to send the world, in my opinion. It was another case of putting egos before the nation, and the Prime Minister should not have failed that test. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it is my opinion that the Prime Minister has taken a risk in returning the Indian pilot so soon. It is mildly humorous that while the entire opposition is banned from leaving the country, one can come bomb us, invade our territory, be defeated by brave PAF pilots, have their plane shot down, but be returned in a matter of days, no questions asked. We all believe, we all believe in humanity and de-escalation, but uh, there has to be a strategy without any form of reciprocation from India, without any uh, any international guarantees for de-escalation, um, one must question the wideness of, this wideness of this and the timing of this decision. At the same time, we still pray that the Prime Minister's risk pays off. Then, then there was the decision of the government not to attend the OIC. This, Mr. Speaker, I believe was a missed opportunity for engagement. It was a missed opportunity to present our case more vigorously in front of the world on a world platform directly to the leaders of the Muslim world. If one had to protest, one had to record their protest, one could have uh, attended and protested uh, in front of the Indian foreign minister, but boycotting such an inter inter important forum is akin to cutting one's nose despite one's face. And then, and then we have the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps we just want to be embarrassed. When when this resolution while, uh, uh, while, while if this resolution was defeated, it would have been an international embarrassment that at a time like this the National Assembly had voted down the resolution. And if it had passed, if this House truly believed that Mr. Khan was worthy of the Nobel Peace Prize, at a time where there is threat of nuclear war, planes are falling from the sky, your soldiers are being martyred on the border, then we would have been nothing less than an international joke. Therefore, I'd like to appreciate, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to appreciate that the government has taken a U-turn on this position as well. Mr. Speaker, we reserve the right, we reserve the right to constructive criticism. However, when it comes to actively resolving this conflict, when it comes to concrete steps towards de-escalation and showing unity on the world stage, this house stands with the government and the opposition is at your service. As a nation, as a nation, however, Mr. Speaker, we must decide how long do we want to give the world this excuse? We don't need to fight terrorism, extremism, banned organizations because the world wants us to, because we're under international pressure, because we're under India's pressure. As the Pakistan People's Party has been saying from the outset, when most, in this in, of, most members of this House were in denial about the threats of extremism and terrorism, we have to combat this mindset for the future of our coming generations. After, after the APS attack, 
after the APS attack, this parliament had decided to endorse a national action plan, a comprehensive, holistic approach to combating this mindset. What happened to the national action plan, Mr. Speaker? What happened to combating hate speech and reforming our curriculum? What happened to no more good or bad Taliban? What happened to action against Punjab's Taliban? What happened to action against banned organizations? What happened to judicial reform? What happened to, what happened to combating terrorist financing and terror-related money laundering? And, Mr. Speaker, what the hell is mainstreaming? How is it possible? How is it possible that this House takes a unanimous decision and the state implements a diametrically contradictory policy, contradictory policy of capitulation, appeasement, and so-called mainstreaming. This is not the policy of the Parliament of Pakistan, and this should not be the policy of Pakistan. What, what sort of sovereign country tolerates the existence of such organizations within its midst? When one's own children are being butchered, how long must we let them fester? How? How is it possible? How is it possible that we hang elected prime ministers, but we can't put Kaladam Tanzime on trial? How is it possible? That there is ethisab only for the opposition, but no ethisab for banned organizations. How can the Prime Minister, how can the Prime Minister claim to be combating corruption when banned organizations enjoy an NRO? How is it possible, Mr. Speaker? How is it possible that there can be a JIT on my breakfast? But we can't have a JIT on Kaladan Tanzime or Esonala Hassan. Do we, do we not owe it to ourselves? Do we not owe it to the Pakistani victims? Do we want? India to keep using them as an excuse to deprive the people of Kashmir of their rights, to continue to viol violate our sovereignty at will, to allow, God forbid, any other of our neighbors or any other country, any other country, to use this excuse or abuse this precedent. We all know, we all know how unjust India's actions have been. We all know that we have been wrong. We should also know that by not implementing the National Action Plan and by not acting on FATF guidelines, we are making our own case weaker. We have heard recently in the news, Mr. Speaker, that Pakistan is considering to take action. We welcome this, we hope it is true. But we heard the same after APS. We consistently heard the same no matter who is Interior Minister in Mr. Sharif's time. We heard the same for the last six months of this government. We hope, Mr. Speaker, that this time, this time is different. We have shown, we have shown the entire country, nay, we've shown the entire world that we can be united. We've shown that we can talk the talk. Now it's time for us to walk the walk. But we need not only take, we need not only take on extremism and, and, and terrorism for our own survival. We also need to win hearts and minds. We need to have an economy 
that works for all, so that desperation and deprivation do not provide the cannon fodder that extremism feeds on. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have not seen any effort to build an economy from the bottom up. The government, the government came into power on the promise of Tabdili. Let's pause for a moment and take a look back at what Tabdili this government has brought. What Tabdili has given us. It has given us electricity price bomb, gas price bomb, and inflationary pressure like we haven't seen for many years. All, all under the slogan of poor friendly. I ask you, Mr. Speaker, I ask you, Mr. Speaker, as the finance minister bothered to ask anyone making the minimum wage how he manages, how he manages to feed his children, send them to school, take care of their health, and pay his bills. We have made it impossible for the poor to breathe in this country, Mr. Speaker. When, when a new government comes in, all eyes are on it. How will they be able to reform and restructure our economy? Signaling is very important. Mr. Speaker, we see no directional change. We see no commitment to the state to take responsibility, to take care of those living in abject poverty. We see no structural reform, no new direction, no new direction to boost the agricultural sector, to boost the industrial sector, to make our stock exchange more effective. We also see no direction to stop the bleeding of state enterprise. Tax collection. Tax collection has been below target and is declining in real terms. We need to seriously think about how to make Pakistan a sovereign economy. The country, this country, has got far too many resources. The most important of all its people to have to remain reliant on the largesse of our friends to pay our bills. The Sindh government, Mr. Speaker, the Sindh government is the only government that not only meets its revenue targets, but surpasses them. If the federal government cannot meet its tax collection targets, if they do not have the competence for this, we offer up the services of the Sindh government, hand over federal tax collection to the you. Chief Minister of Sindh as well. We'll perform for you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I see, I see no direction from this government to make Pakistan economically sovereign. There is much, there is much this government has given us to complain about. The most serious damage they have done is trying to fool this nation's poor. We have been given sermons on austerity and cutting costs. But the facts tell us another story. The facts say the current expenditure is up by 439 billion rupees. There has been indecision upon indecision and three budgets in one fiscal year and still no direction. Can you imagine doing business in this country where your taxes change three times in one year? Mr. Speaker, there have been cuts where there should not have been cuts in the health sector, in the educational sector, to jobs, and there's been relief to the rich and broken promises to the rest. This government is trying to run the country on peak economics while being deaf, dumb, and blind to the plight of the average Pakistani who is dying under the weight of price hikes this government has even raised the price of medicine. There is, there is nothing in this budget. There is nothing in this budget for farmers, for laborers, for pensioners. Karachi has been ignored once again. I ask the government allies from the MQM, you must join us in demanding 
in demanding that Karachi gets the package that it deserves. PTI claims to have won a mandate from Karachi. It is time for them to deliver in Karachi. Balochistan has been ignored once again. How long will we ignore the people of Balochistan? Particularly when right now they are suffering as a result of the recent heavy rains and floods. The, once again, there's nothing for South Punjab. There's nothing for Fata. And Sindh is still owed 116 billion rupees. Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate once again that on foreign policy, on terrorism, on the economy, we are willing to work with the government in the greater national, in the greater national interest. Because we have crises on many fronts. We have a border crisis. We have foreign policy crises. We have domestic crises. We have an economic crisis. We have a crisis of democracy, and we have a human rights crisis. And it is my generation, Mr. Speaker, it is my generation that will pay in blood, coin, sweat, and tears for the decisions made today. We will pay for these disastrous economic decisions. We will pay for the cost of any conflict, and we will pay for the domestic and democratic crises. We, the youth, are the future of this country and this region, and our fate are in the hands of our government. I pray to Almighty Allah to guide them so we can defeat the enemies of peace from within and without, so we can build a future for coming generations so that we can lift our poor out of poverty so that we can fulfill Jinnah's dream of a peaceful, prosperous and progressive Pakistan, Pakistan, Zindabad.